Wise, president of uh, Friends of Christopher Columbus Park, to uh, review her organization and the School for Park Programming and uh, its great resources. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and fun to talk about one of the most important things in my life. Uh, there are very few similarities between the big organizations that we've just heard about and the Friends of Christopher Columbus Park. We were founded in 2001, and we actually have two of the founding members here, Chris Fincham and Suzanne Lavoie. And it was founded when the park was renovated by the city, uh, and the Friends group was an, uh, an offshoot of that. And we are all volunteers, and we're made up of businesses and neighbors uh, in the area. So we have a very distinct mission. And we follow our bylaws and look to our mission when we decide what are we going to do and how do we operate. So our mission is to enhance, improve, promote, maintain, and utilize the park. These aren't very many words, but it really is an awful lot of things that we do based on those words. That little P in there was a very, very pretty piece of artwork <laughs> that when it translated to this computer came out to be a piece. <laughs> So you weren't going to push it. Uh, looks like a parking. Uh, exactly. Uh, well, that's all about the conversation about traffic. Uh, so we, it is a park for all seasons. And as I said, it was a multi-million dollar renovation in 2000 uh, that dramatically changed the park. At the time, there were uh, bushes that obscured the view of the, the police from looking in, there were homeless, uh, not that we don't have homeless sleeping in the park now, but there were many more people, many more hidden places for people to be, and it was somewhat unsafe in, in a very safe neighborhood, but there were problems. So, And there are three trellises, if you're familiar with it, and initially the three trellises, two were in a straight line and one pointed towards the Marriott. That was changed, now they're all in a straight line. Uh, we have the Rose Kennedy Memorial Rose Garden that is in the park, a tot lot playground, a spray fountain, uh, expansive lawns, and we call them the East Lawn and the West Lawn. Uh, we divide that when we're having events so people know which lawn the, the next little event will be at. The trellises are covered in wisteria, which are absolutely stunning in, in the spring. And Christopher Columbus Park, under the trellis, has been voted one of the top ten most kissable places in Boston. All right. Places. So I think you've gotten to get the feeling for what this is. It's a city park. Uh, we work very, very closely with the Parks Department. Tony Pollock and her staff have been wonderful working with us. We now have uh, a 12-year history working with the parks, and so when a friends group comes, comes to the city and says, we want to do this or we want to do that, you have to have a track record. And I think we have established our track record, so we have a wonderful relationship. Uh, I can't go through this without beginning with some of the beautiful pictures. Uh, this is the, what we call the west entrance to the park. It's right by Tia's. And then, of course, the view from the water, uh, beautiful, uh, there's the trellises and steps, it's a lot of open area. Our wonderful Christopher Columbus. The spray fountain uh, is just, it's constantly busy in the summer. I was at a conference last summer in uh, uh, New York, uh, the Greener and Greater Conference. I think m many people here were at that. And one thing that struck me that somebody said was that public parks are today the great equalizer. There's, there's nothing, uh, there's no, no level of are you, you know, high level, low level, economically, uh, socially. Everybody's in a park, and we certainly see that in our park constantly, as you do on the Greenway. Uh, this is just one of those ah uh, pictures. Uh, it's one of my favorites. And she came totally prepared for the water. Uh, again, this is the West Lawn, and in the background there is the Rose Kennedy Rose Garden. All of the flower beds around are maintained by the city. We do the two big beds, the Rose Garden and what we call the Crescent Garden. Um, beautiful view from the water. Imagine coming in when you're coming back from the, the Harbor Islands and this is what you see and it's so welcoming. And even though you've got all the city in the background, the first thing you see is this beautiful, relaxing, tranquil park. Very different 
than the other side of the Marriott, which is a much busier area. You're sitting in the park, you're just apt to see one of the fireboats saluting something. Uh, a couple of years ago, they were doing quite a bit of testing, and I don't know why they were testing it right at the edge of the harbor, but you could see what was gonna happen, and all of a sudden, everybody got out of the way except an elderly couple, and they just laughed. They got totally stuck. <laughs> so you never know what'll happen in the park. Families picnicking, um, that's just very common. It's used uh, by all types of people. Again, just a couple of nice, really pretty pictures of the, the grass. I love this shot with the custom tower in the background. And when we say a park for all seasons, here's a very pretty picture of the autumn. And now this is actually a shot that was uh, AP. It was run all over the world. Um, I don't think it's very enticing about wanting you to come to Boston, but uh, it's not that in the winter, but it is a beautiful picture. And many of the pictures, good number of the pictures that are in this uh, presentation were taken by our very own Matt Conti of North End Boston. Right now. So what do we do? We do horticulture, entertainment, maintenance, fundraising, communication, lighting winter nights, and so if that isn't enough, we have a capital improvement project that is really the focus uh, of what I want to talk about today as it impacts this area. So just a few of the things. Over the years, we, our fundraising dollars go towards new trees. Uh, just in 2006, we put in nine Hawthorne trees by the top lot. 2008, that was a big project, 30 for us, $37,000. And where these trees go were based on a master plan that was done in about 2004. Hired a horticulturist and reviewed all, uh, analyzed all of the trees, gave us the life of the trees, the expect, expect, expectancy of them, uh, what we needed to do to maintain them, and then where could we put in, in already quite a tree to the park, uh, more trees that would add to shade and the whole feeling. Uh, annual maintenance, fertilization, and new plantings. Um, we pay to fertilize trees. That's not something that the city of Boston does. There are the old oaks that line the, uh, the trellises, and they weren't in very good shape. And about five years ago, we started to do the deep root fall um, <coughs> fertilizing of them. And even Schumacher uh, said they just couldn't believe how much they came, <coughs> excuse me, how much they came around. Uh, they just didn't think that they had that much spunk still left in. So we keep feeding them. Uh, this is the Crescent Garden I mentioned earlier, and this is totally maintained by our horticultural staff. Uh, and we uh, buy plantings for this as well as for the Rose Garden. And there is the Rose Garden. Uh, this summer, for example, um, as you mentioned, uh, Phil, that the, you know, we had the, the July heat and we had the rain. So we had 27 stressed rose bushes as we began the summer season. And through great love and care, I think we lost four of them. Um, but the rest all came, came through. So it's, it's, we have about 20 people who are volunteers in the Rose Garden. They work for one hour on Wednesday evening and one hour on Sunday mornings. And here's four of our team. And these are the roses on the outside of the Rose Garden, and they're just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, Hurricane Sandy, we lost uh, two trees. I think the whole Greenway, they only seen they lost one, and I don't know why we lost two. But uh, we approached Sunstone Hotel Investors, which is the company that owns the Marriott building, and they sponsored the replacement of the two trees. Uh, our Independence Day celebration, we have a parade, a magician, marionettes, fire trucks. We've done this now, I think, for three years. Uh, and it's a good long afternoon of programming that is open to anybody who walks through the park. We have tourists from all over the country, we have neighbors, and we have the local uh, suburbanites who happen to come into the city. Uh, here's our Uncle Sam on stilts. And uh, we had, this was from last year, we had some, when the tall ships were in, and we had the Coast Guard come, and so we had a wonderful presentation with them. And we have music. Now you know how little that park is. Yeah. So we walk really slowly. <laughs> <laughs> and the children have little musical uh, instruments that are given by the North End uh, Performing Arts. And so they make all kinds of racket. And the kids think this is the best thing ever. <laughs> and then here we have uh, 
the magician, or the juggler, Jenny the juggler, and those two handsome little boys there happen to be my grandsons. <laughs> and so Matt is always kind enough, every year he gets us lined up and we get one of these wonderful pictures, so this is one of Matt's shots. We also, for entertainment, we have Sunday night movies in the park. Here's E.T. and uh, The Miracle on Ice. And they're sponsored by Joe Bono, who owns El Dente and Benevento's restaurants and the Boston Push Cart. We do seven or eight Sunday nights in the park. And we walk around and introduce people to the, the friends <coughs> and welcome them to the, uh, to the area. Uh, again, Columbus Day, it's the same kind of event that we do on the 4th of July. And we have, um, we have 300, over 300 paid members in the organization. Uh, that's businesses and individuals. And out of that, we have more than 50 active members. And when I say active, I mean really active. People really get involved. They really do a lot. We had, uh, for Columbus Day, we had about 20 volunteers. And we needed every one of them. It was very busy. Uh, this year, our uh, Uncle Sam on stilts morphed into Christopher Columbus. <laughs> And then maintenance. Our maintenance role is, is not big. The city takes care of uh, you know, the, the major, uh, obviously, the infrastructure. We do have an infrastructure committee, though, that analyzes annually some of the things that need to be done and present a, a report to the Parks Department. Um, the tot lot is one we've really worked on lighting there. Uh, we had an incident with homeless in the park and the Parks Department responded very quickly, installed two new big, huge lights, put light bulbs or new light bulbs in areas that the, we didn't even know light fixtures were there because it was overgrown. Um, and then we have an annual cleanup day for the tot lot, and it really is a social event more than anything. We buy new sand, take out the old sand from the sandbox, and uh, so here's one of the dads, he's shoveling. Uh, here's a little kid, we have little brooms, little shovels. So I think the last one, we had about 75 people at least at this cleanup. And we then have a magician there too. So it's, it's about an hour and a half, two hours. Great neighborhood fun. And getting the younger generation involved. You know, these families, they don't have the time to do the kind of work we do because they're raising families and working. And, uh, but this is one time that they can give back and really get involved. Um, this is our secret weapon for maintenance. I don't know if any of you have ever seen Joan Murphy. Every morning, she is in Columbus Park. She has, goes to the shed, gets a trash bag, a stick, and she's out there for an hour, an hour and a half or better uh, cleaning up that park. And even you know, the maintenance department, the city maintenance department says without her, this park would never look the way it does. So it's absolutely pristine. Our fundraising efforts. Um, we have a summer sunset cocktail cruise for members only, and Voyager 3, one of the whale watching boats, is donated by Boston's Best Cruises. So we have a relationship with them, uh, and that way they donate the ship. We charge, I think it was $45 a ticket for you know three hours on the water, and it just absolutely a spectacular night. The funds we raise from that go to our Columbus Day event. And I forgot to mention earlier, the games, when you saw the children with different games, those are all Greenway games. So we borrow them from the Greenway, and so we've got a nice relationship with them, too. Um, this is a new program that somebody, one of our members, just thought of, and we thought, oh, why didn't we ever think of that one before? Adopt the light. So at our Columbus Day, we had a beautiful poster, and for a dollar, you could adopt the light and then sign your name on the poster that we'll hold up in our trellis lighting uh, <laughs> that night. So we made several hundred dollars on that. And then our major fundraiser is, um, used to be a gala, now it's a Monte Carlo night. This is our second year. And it's at Battery Wharf uh, Fairmont Hotel on Saturday, November 16th. And it's great fun. All of the equipment looks like you're in Vegas. Uh, you know, uplift, lift, wheels, everything. It's just gorgeous, so. Our corporate sponsors. This is our main revenue source. Uh, we, our members, are, account for probably a third of the revenue that we take in. Um, and then what we make at the uh, Monte Carlo night. But without these sponsors who make significant financial contributions, significant in our world, <laughs> there wouldn't be anything in, in the bigger world. Uh, and every year we're, we're getting more and more. We asked um, Sunstone last year for the first time, as I said, and so they, they contributed. And North End, 
waterfront.com. And then the neighborhood supporters, uh, the, the condominiums in the neighborhood, and those are smaller amounts, but they're all very, very significant, again, to us. And it also lets those people know, you know that, yes, we're supporting the park, too. Even if people who live in the building support it, still getting this uh, from these organizations is really helpful. Communication. This is our website. Uh, it's updated uh, very consistently, uh, and people can go not only to learn about what's going on in the park, but what's going on in the whole area. Uh, a newsletter. We have a, a newsletter that goes out at least once a month, usually more than that, because there's other things that are going on. And that's our uh, volunteers from our infrastructure, from our um, internet communications uh, group. And we have an old-fashioned bullet board. So right in the park is the bullet board that's Meredith, and she painted it. She painted the bullet board. I walked through, and there she was on the ladder painting. And she maintains it, and so the posting's there for folks who are just walking through to wonder what's going on. And then our, the reason that we all do this is for our beautiful trellis lighting. Uh, so we light, as it says, uh, bathe the trellis in blue lights and illuminate 14 trees. And that's an annual cost of $30,000. Uh, this has become an iconic image of Boston. Pictures appear on calendars, uh, greeting cards, and it's, you know, the view, imagine again, you're coming in from the water, look at those lights. This one, I think this is one of Matt's also. Uh, that was. It just, it's so spectacular. You think what the, the, what that looked like. We think about it. What did it look like when those trellises weren't lit? It was so dark. This is our uh, holiday trellis lighting. This year will be Monday, November 25th, about 5.30. Um, Ermanino is supposed to be there. We have uh, children from the North End come. They sing Christmas carols. Uh, we have Santa Claus comes. Uh, people about candy canes. Starbucks has coffee, hot chocolate. So again, it's a very community, uh, and we have several hundred people coming to this. So our capital improvement project, as I mentioned earlier, when the park was renovated in 2000, and they ran out of money, which seems to be the standard, uh, there was a section, this right in the crossroads, that this circle has no, no uh, irrigation. So. They put in three trees, they put in some perennials, and here we are 13 years later with this kind of giant circle. So this gives you the view from viewer, you know, walking from the pavilion down. And see, the asphalt was so huge. So it's just sitting there, looking down from the Marriott. So the original plan was not even to put that in there. It was just supposed to be all asphalt. And that's when the friends group said, wait, we've got to do something. So they cut out a 24-foot circle, and then, as I said, put in the trees. The trees have survived quite well, surprisingly. Here's another good view. So in looking at what we can do as an organization to improve this park, uh, that's the one area that is, is just so needing of attention. So we wanted to expand this, this space. So the challenges are, it's a non-irrigated arid space at the edge of this gorgeous park. It's a non-welcoming space. It's a circle. And you walk past it, and people don't even really notice it. It's a space that, when the park was redone in 2000, was very little traffic. It was the years before the Greenway was a reality. It was years before the Harbor Alliance Pavilion. But right today, it lies, as you can see, as you're talking about the, the pavilion and the traffic to and from the ferry, it's right at that crossroads. So they're coming from the aquarium, they go to the north end, and there are thousands of people. There's a dearth of shade on the harbor walk. We've talked about that in other meetings. And so people will cluster on those few benches, if the sun is right, to sit in the shade. And the biggest challenge is that we are a very small, not-for-profit, all-volunteer organization. So we took all that into consideration, but that didn't stop us. <laughs> We're moving forward. Um, so the step, step one was to work with the city uh, parks department. And we went to Tony Pollock and we talked about this and with the chief landscape architect to help us develop a budget and a vision. And we created what we now call the Urban Oasis Committee. 
It was first the cross circle crossroads or crossroads projects, but now it's evolved into urban oasis, which is really the most appropriate title because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make a space that is irrigated, that we bring electricity to it so that when we have the Sunday night movies, we're not stringing all the uh, cords from one end to the other. Um, and so we first applied for grants, and we applied for a grant from the Blo Blossom Fund of the Garden Clubs of America, and that was a $10,000 grant. Then the city's Beautify Boston project, that gave us $20,000. Wow. So that was pretty significant, $30,000. We have a, a budget of about 80000 so that's for just what we do all year long. Then we sent out an RFQ, again with the help of the city parks department, for a landscape architect. We interviewed two firms that replied, and we selected the Alta 3 design. So this is, of course, they, they walked the park. We all met with them. They went down, they went to see what did it look like in the day, what did it look like in the night, what did it look like on the weekend. And obviously, this is, this is the section that we're talking about, this little yellow right there. And so how is that impacted from the people coming from the harbor, coming from the north end, going to the north end, coming from the greenway? So we had to look at all those traffic patterns. Right now, this space, this circle, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't impact the way anybody walks. You know, if you stand there and watch them, everybody can go around it. And while, yes, it is busy and it sounds like there's a gazillion people going, you have to think they're not rushing to work. People who are going through this park, for the most part, part are meandering. And so that makes a different feel. When they're coming off the boats, if they've been to the, the harbor, they're coming off in, a, in normally a very nice mood, relaxed mood, so you don't have people running and pushing. But we really took seriously into consideration these traffic, uh, excuse me, traffic flows. Um, and and they did a wind study, the summer winds and the winter winds, and looking how would that impact the plants that you would put in. Luckily, we have the three honey locusts that, as I said, have survived, have done well, so we've got history there, plus the history of the other plants we have in the park. Drainage utilities, look what's underneath. Looking at the water utilities, the electrical utilities, and that's important because, as I said, we want to add some light, not a lot, but some light to this circle, and then also bring a power source to it. So the vision was to go from this, and we don't have a definite picture yet of what it is. We're in about our third iteration. But we want to go, this was what a poster that I used when I presented to different neighborhood groups. Go from that to this. Trees, people relaxing, and a much a welcoming space. So here's the budget as it stands now. We're looking at $225,000, the two grants, $100,000 from our organization, and then a fundraising effort uh, of $95,000. And I think that's very doable for the kinds of the kind of project we're doing. Um, the time. Uh, by spring, we should be able to break ground. I know that uh, Chris told me he's meeting with the city's landscape architect, Liza Meyer, in a week or so to look at it, how it relates to the BRA, uh, because that's obviously very important. How is there? Because we abut the BRA property. So this is what our vision is for a very small part of uh, the, the harbor and the waterfront. and. Uh, we just hope that you, as our neighbors, would do your would join us at our event on November 16th and uh, help us support uh, one of the what we think is one of the gems of the city in Boston. Because ultimately, what we're doing is building community. Thank you very much. Any questions? Advisory committee, any questions on? How much does it cost to go to Monte Carlo and where can I get tickets? Well, I'm so glad you asked me that. <laughs> <laughs> I just happen to have, and with my able assistant here, I happen to have a uh, little information about it. It's $135 a ticket. And, uh, and really, you'll be very sorry if you miss it. Bud, did you have a question? So I got to ask Joanne and Phil. 
fill in an image of a better pathway from the Harbor Pavilion down to your docks. And Joanne's got an image of a quiet landscape area in that circle, which is right along that path or somewhat on a tangent to it. How do we reconcile those two needs? I do follow you, and I think, and that was and, one of the, and Marriott's idea of putting it, putting it, you know, more retail or whatever around there. Uh, the this wouldn't impact the Marriott because this is at you come out of the doors of the Marriott and it lies in front of you, so there wouldn't be any retail space right there on that side of the building. Uh, and that's why they did the study of the gaps and how does everybody get from point A to point B. And we thought about that very seriously and. When you start to do something like this, you know, you really start to look at when you're in the park, looking at how are people walking and where do they go? And they walk through the, the you've got tables and chairs on the PRA property. They walk through those tables and chairs. They, they just go every which way. So that's the challenge. We want this to be big enough to do what we want it to do, to give some shade, give some really nice, sweet seating um, that doesn't exist now. Uh, but in no way impede that traffic flow. One of the, one of the, I don't think they're necessarily incompatible, but one of the challenges there is there's a vendor that sort of sits right there in the middle that blocks the view from yeah. straight down there. And if you could move that some other place where it ends up in, in something built with the Marriott or whatever, that, that vendor sort of really blocks that view. And I think you could do a lot with consistent signs and banners yeah. and things like that that make it clear that this is the way to go down to the ferries. So I don't think the two are incompatible. No, I don't think they are. For all that you do, and that's great. I love the presentation. It's a great time today. For all that you do, what, what's the city's responsibility? What, what, is, what is the parks department of the city? Uh, what, what role do they play? Right. Well, the, it's, the, it's the city park. We have to keep reminding ourselves of that. It's very difficult. <laughs> uh, and people ask that question. When you do all this, what is the city do? Well, the city you know, takes care of the grass. We do prune the trees, they don't do that. Um, so it's their part, all the infrastructure, you know, if anything, the granite's chipped or, you know, different things like that, they come in, the light fixtures, they have to take care of all that. And we have to ask and ask and ask. We have probably been asking for new trash barrels for almost 10 years, since the Democratic National Convention when they come out. And now we have uh, gas, or uh, yeah. oil, oil, oil barrels. Yeah. Um, but it, when you think, this is at least how I think about it. When you look at a city like Boston, this is a park that is definitely one of the gems. And friends of the Public Garden, they do what they do over there, and that is a gem. There are parks in this city that are pathetic, and they're in neighborhoods, they have children, they have families. If I was going to say where would I rather have, if I had extra money as a city manager, where would I put it? I'd put it with them. We have a neighborhood that really has taken ownership and pride and have we have re personally great benefits in the community that we're building because of this. So I look at it as we've got a beautiful Sunday and we're putting the whipped cream and the cherry on the top. All right. Oh. <laughs> any final questions from general public for any of the uh, presenters today? Sorry, Phil or Linda? Chris? Um, Chris Fincher of the Royal Fishery Council. I just have a plea for action. I don't know how many years I've sat through meetings and everybody says we ought to do some signage and nothing ever happens. And it, isn't that the BR, maybe the BRA should lead on it, but it doesn't have to be perfect. Just, I mean, the sign is so simple, you put a thing like that and a thing like that. <laughs> <laughs> some of the panels that have been recently installed um, strategically around Long Wharf to provide better wayfinding access to provide better wayfinding. I've yet to get down there to take a look. Unfortunately, Dick Mulligan, who's just here with our asset management, has left. But um, I think that those are in place. But that's a common theme that, that comes up again and again. But you need overall signage. Yeah. You, need, you need general signage for the whole area. You need yeah. you know, to push it this way for the ships yeah. from this place. I, I would like to personally see, uh, for, the, for the boats, yeah. uh, a board like you have at South Station, with boat leaving for and the time and so on. Yeah, I've recently heard of some folks have been doing gorilla signage where they just post their own signs yeah. and linking, you know, this location, you know, three quarters of a mile away, this and, and doing their own thing. So it's, it's sort of an interesting yeah. habit. Well, we've talked about it for at least yeah. 10 years, but it may be time to do something. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to be a consistent concern. Um, 
you know, we talk so much about activation, and I think that we've seen the green wave as is getting more and more activated every day. The other goal that the BRA had was to make this a residential community, which it is. I don't know what the total population is, but as the programming continues, just be cognizant of that and keep the noise level down, because I think the noise pollution, which we don't talk about too much, you know, the young kids are used to this stuff in the ear. I'm a physician. So I can tell you that a lot of the over 25s are partially deaf already. <laughs> and I think that everybody wants this noise level. And they want it so we continue and give them. You know, would you give an alcoholic more alcohol? <laughs> and, and I'm serious about this because the noise level, it, it is to the point of noise pollution. And I think we have to be adults in here and say that you may not exceed a certain decibel level. Well, there are standards that are I know the standards, but they're exceeded constantly. I mean, you've got the traffic. I mean, obviously, with the elevated artery going away, I mean, I was just thinking the other day of the constant hush and rush of traffic that used to be <laughs> coursing through the center of the city and how much quieter it is now with that gone. But yeah, there's different types of noise dynamics. It's that are like music, uh, music through the speakers. It's, uh, I think it's a little louder than it needs to be. Yeah, the hard and I like loud so music. Much, there's so much hardscape that and it reverberates because it's like a cannon. We've got New York City cannon. So that really needs to be considered. Okay, very good. Thanks. Well, very good. Our next meeting will be uh, November 20th. That'll be at Atlantic Wharf. Um, again, next Friday we've got the uh, subcommittee on waterfront programming and activation and um, just a point of interest next Tuesday evening I believe they'll be illuminating the uh, old Northern Avenue bridge I think that's at 615 for anyone interested oh. and go Red Sox yeah <laughs> thank you um, we're gonna try to get those remaining property owners in so uh, uh, GSA building the Coast Guard building um, hook lobster hopefully we'll have their program by then um, 400 Atlantic and then uh, maybe someone from Public Works in on the Northern Avenue Bridge